that I wake up to see the sun in the east. Yesterday you can't... Everyone has a lot of shared life experiences and kind of getting past the generational differences and saying, hey, we have so much more in common than we have that's uncommon is I think one of the huge benefits of storytelling. Being in the presence of people who are willing to share stories and listen to stories and to make space for each other um, has had a really powerful impact on me, not just as a listener. I mean, it's definitely improved my listening skills, um, but just, just, just how I see the world and how I interpret the world and how much bigger the world has gotten for me. And it's a really, it's a constant reminder of how big the world really is. And I really love that. The whistle that echoes, echoes my name Like a voice that's calling me back It started, I was at a faculty retreat with some other English professors and uh, Paul Hauser, who was a senior English faculty member and I was a newbie, we were talking about the course of college writing and what are some different themes you could put into it. And Paul brought up this idea of, you know, I would like to do something with interviews and voice and capturing stories. Because his mom had recently passed away and he said, what I wouldn't give to hear her voice again. And that kind of got the conversation started about what if we had students working with older adults and captured those recorded voices. After she was gone one year, we had a, a family celebration and we had maybe one minute of her on a videotape. And I thought, w wouldn't it be great if we had her talking, you know, for half an hour, telling stories or reminiscing? And I kept thinking about that and also about whether I was really doing any good in the classroom. I mean, is it, writing essays, is that really that important for students, you know, do, do they get invested in it? And most of the time, not really. You know, after over 30 years of teaching English, yeah, I wanted something more meaningful. And I think that's how the idea, you know, started, the, the seed of it. And they've been living there long enough that they don't always know. There wasn't a lot of material at the very beginning. When Paula and I first began, we kept looking for articles or sort of narrative pieces, especially that would begin talking and teaching students about narrative essays based on stories. And Mary Swander provided a great source from this um, collection of essays about Midwestern gardeners, Parsons in the Snow. She went out with Jane Ann Staw and did collected interviews over on a tape recorder, and then came back and transcribed them and then put them into narrative essays. And that was one of the best examples, and I still use it. Um, partly because Mary also came to Kirkwood and talked about how she put that collection together, which really became a blueprint for my students, too, about how do you take this six hours of interviews, transcribe some of it, what do you pull out, what do you edit, how do you edit, how do you tell that authentic story. So that was one of the best first texts that's still a, an anchor for my course. You know, before we started calling this oral history, you know, this very sort of Western formal academic term, you know, people over the centuries in many cultures, every culture around the world, passed, passed down knowledge and information and ways to live and ways to be through oral sources and storytelling. And so really, this is just a continuation of that process. And when I think of cross-generational storytelling, I think it is as, as a sort of a, a cultural memory transfer because there's a lot of knowledge and wisdom that needs to get shared from one generation to the next. And we don't create enough opportunities for that. And I think a lot of that gets lost. And oral history, I think, is a very powerful conduit to capture that and share it. And I think, especially across cultures, not just generation, but cultures, and what people can, can learn about uh, elders from different cultures, in, in addition to you know, a culture that they feel that they identify with, which I think is another really important and powerful uh, tool for, for sharing love and empathy. There's always that kind of common misconception that goes along with the idea of aging, uh, especially with younger population. I think it's kind of a negative term, like I'm aging, and people think, oh my gosh. Um, but it's really important to remember to kind of take a step back and re-look really at that type of stereotype and 
treat them like any other person would. Uh, they, they, they really fear that they're gonna start to lose their independence and look, be looked down upon. People know, if they know anything uh, about aging, that um, we have an aging population. So there are more people over 50 in the Johnson County area um, than ever. In Johnson County, because we have the University of Iowa and Kirkwood Community College, we don't have um, the same demographics as the rest of the state. We're a little, little bit, we skew a little bit younger, but we also have a lot of older adults that are finding Iowa City as a place to retire. It's becoming much more a prominent issue for this generation because they are going to be a smaller number of young people compared to the baby boomers that are aging out. And the way I pitch it to the students is you will have to deal with old people in your future, in your families, in your society, your neighbors, people you work with, in whatever careers you choose to work in, you have to work with older adults. Intergenerational relationships are really healthy. Uh, there's a huge issue. About 20% of older adults in America are socially isolated. So that, that relationship with the younger students is super important. A lot of times with our clients, we see they're alone, they don't have family, they don't have kids. So that's really making a huge impact on their lives. I want to be a doctor and specifically I want to be a cardiovascular surgeon. I took this course specifically for having an, a background on talking with older adults and I think that meeting these seniors will help me in getting a background on how to talk to older um, people since um, being a cardiovascular surgeon, you'll work with a lot of older adults. And so I think this would be a great opportunity to be able to get a sense on who they are, how to talk to them, and making sure they feel comfortable with me um, and me being comfortable around them for sure. I think you can build a lot of understanding by listening to each other and uh, understanding everybody's different people's backgrounds and seeing how common their experiences are and yours. I'm just really excited to, because this is like something that I've never really done before because my grandparents don't live near here, so I don't have a lot of contact with seniors, so this is going to be a fun project for me to get kind of a, a new look on things from an older person that probably has a lot more knowledge and wisdom than me. I should improve my English. <laughs> it's most important to me. And uh, then I think I can learn something uh, in the different culture and uh, uh, from American prison. Uh, their, their culture and uh, their habits and their spirits, something uh, different uh, with our culture. Well, my mom did the same thing. She did her life story. And I, I read it, but then when she passed away or later in her life, I really read it. And it had so much meaning because I knew this was, this is all I've got. I'm hoping that the Senior Citizen Project kind of develops like a relationship and gets to be like a close thing where I really know them well and we kind of share stories because I feel like that would be really interesting to see what, you know, my life might be like later on down the road. I remember reading a book and it was about older people and, and it, it was one thing that stood out to me. It was like water runs downstream. It's your responsibility as an older person to share or be responsible or um, warn <laughs> uh, younger people. Um, probably share what you've learned to the extent that they want to hear it <laughs> or not. <laughs> It's been interesting, as the baby boomers have aged out, how many more and more and more resources are becoming available. Partly because I think aging in America is taking more of a precedence in our society. We have a larger aging population, so people are looking at older adults in different ways. And not just from a health perspective, but from a sociology perspective and a psychology perspective and a sort of intergenerational perspective. And all of those things can add to the course content that I approach. There was one um, article that was about the best way to age is to have seven daughters. Because if you have seven daughters, you're going to have plenty of daughters to take care of you when you're old. Because daughters tend to take more care of their adult parents than their sons.
So yesterday we went to the senior center and um, I always like to do a tour there just so the students have a sense of being in the space where older adults are. It's always a little tricky getting students downtown, you know, setting up where am I going, where am I parking, and there's always a few stragglers as there were, but it really is a great environment for them to be in just to see what a senior community looks like. Due to the Iowa City Johnson County Senior Center, my name is Michelle Buman and I'm the program specialist here at the Senior Center. I'm Emily Edrington, I'm the community outreach specialist. And um, this is room 103. Uh, this is a multi-purpose classroom that we have. It's a building they probably walk by three times a week easy and just have never gone into because it's right downtown center of Iowa City and it's a unique environment to most senior centers around the country I mean that that we have that space the city government of Iowa City supports it um, it's a really unique thing for them to see um, it was very interesting going in was interesting because we got to see all these people um, go to band practice which is really cool um, they looked like they were having fun socializing and their skills on playing an instrument was really really good I think it's crazy that some of them like actually are interested in still learning about like math and science and people are actually going to these classes they have a lot of exercise classes so they're really intense on like staying fit so that's good the other part of the tour was them to go and see ecumenical towers. Um, and I really wanted them to, again, just get in, into the physical space where we're gonna be working with the seniors, see what their world looks like a little bit. Sometimes the hardest part is just walking in the door. And now we've gotten through that. I really like the uh, ecumenical towers, how she described it, how like they're still independent. It's not like they're being like 24 hour watch. Like when they come here, they wanna live independently and they're still able to have that sense of independence, but also be able to like somewhat being taken care of without like a nursing home, they feel like it's probably overbearing. I think part of the success of this project is there's a lot of groundwork at the beginning for me administratively. So everybody kind of knows what they're getting into. And then um, the biography page that they fill out as a way to start the process, it really lets me know what the seniors about, my students do the same thing, and that allows me to kind of match together personalities, interests. I tell my students we're playing match.com a little bit with, you know, partnering, but um, it does help because I find pairings that really work out a lot better. Tim, you get to work with Judy. She's the one that was a semi driver. Cool. Yeah. So today is one of my favorite days because they find out about their senior placements today. I've been spending the last few days just organizing placements and figuring out who goes where. I asked the students, um, based on the seniors that submitted their preferences, we had 13 um, older adults sign up and um, and I shared with them their biographies a little bit, you know, about this is Johnny and she's a teacher and she's also traveled a lot, or this is Ruth and she likes tap dancing. And so they got to know a little bit about those seniors. And then I asked the students, is there someone that sounds interesting to you based on their background? And also, is there a partner in class that you could work well with? And I asked them to narrate a little bit about what kind of person they wanted to work with and why. Um, and that helped me just to kind of do some matching. Margie Bell, you get to work with Joe Myers Walker, the artist of Franciscan. My mom. It's going to be a little weird, but we'll talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> Taylor, you get to work with Louise. She's our clarinetist and singer who's done, look at all of these different jobs. Cool. That was the only one I forgot in there. <laughs> I know. So I handed out the biography sheets. So the seniors filled out the biography sheet as well as the students. And now the student ones I'm mailing off to their senior partners today. So when they actually meet next Thursday for the first time, they'll have a little introduction, at least on paper to each other and a phone call. So it was pretty exciting. They were all quiet and just pouring over it. I have a Joe or Carol Jo Myers. Um, she is the mother of my teacher which is very interesting um i right now i'm like learning more about her like her favorite hobbies and personal interests she likes dancing she likes zumba she likes hip-hop she likes 50 cent am i supposed to get the rest of this she loves chocolate she's actually gonna email that and so you'll email she volunteers which is really cool 
Um, she's been to France. Like, how cool is that, right? I'm very, very, very excited to learn more about her. I'm super excited. Everybody gets so nervous on the first day. It's really hard to walk in and just meet a total stranger. Find a place to park, get there, come in with your questions. And, and the weight of just meeting somebody new with a homework assignment of a sort, it just makes it a lot more daunting. It's that first moment, right? But then also, from my teacher point of view, I'm often just observing what I see, how the students are interacting, how comfortable they feel with the senior from the very beginning. Um, it's a great moment to capture because I know what's coming later on at the end about how rich those relationships will be at the end and how that maybe slight uncomfortable moment at the beginning is gonna seem so inconsequential later on. I was actually scared at first. I was like, what if they don't like me? Because it's like a different, like different generations and different um, like styles, I guess, of how I could look or how they would expect someone, or like a young lady to look like or um, dress. So at first I was like scared. I was like, what if they don't like me? Or what if, you know, they're like kind of rudish to me and they don't want to open up to me. Um, so that was my, my first reaction. Um, but then afterwards, I met with Rick and I met like everyone else. I was like, okay, this is going to be a fun project, getting to hear what they have to say. I was nervous going up there because when I got there, my partner wasn't there, so I knew I had to kind of do it on my own. I was like, oh my gosh, what's she going to be like? Is she going to be mean? Is she going to be happy? Is she going to not like me already? Is she going to open the door? Is she going to be smiling? Is she going to be unhappy? Is she tired? And like, I was just going through everything that could possibly be happening so I could kind of prepare myself for what I was getting into that day. Um, but no, it everything, and all my fears turned out to be fine because she was awesome. I love kids, so I think talking to them about their lives and hearing what their story is, and I could kind of share a little bit of what it was like for me. Um, yeah, that was, I learned a lot from them. You know, times have changed, and they're in a whole different spot with their technology and so on. Uh, but we still have the same needs and confusions. <laughs>and my students are busy, so having schedules that conform to them meeting together is really challenging, just to have them work together, because a lot of these retired adults are active, busy seniors. They go on trips, they're volunteering, and that's something that surprises my students, because they think they're a college student and they're the only ones that have busy lives. So that's the first thing that they struggle with is, oh, my person's going on a canoe trip for three weeks, what do I do? <laughs> But the other thing that happens, because they're older adults and aging, um, you know, they have health compromises. So we're asking these writing students not only to be thinking about the mechanics of their writing, but you write the social interaction and taking somebody's authentic story and delivering it in a way that's meaningful to that somebody. Um, Shelby may have shared with you that last year we had one of our older participants pass away during the semester, and it was a tremendously meaningful thing for all of us to be able to turn over the recordings of that grandpa's voice to his family. So when my student found out that news, it was really tragic and I had to, I talked a lot about with my counseling staff and the dean about just to, sort of how to handle it when I found out before he did. Um, and, and then we talked about just where he was in the project, what he felt comfortable doing. He needed some time to kind of grieve because he had this short term but pretty intense relationship with his older adult. And for my student, it was a really profound experience for him and hard, it was just hard, but I was really pleased that he just handled it so graciously. 
It was just a really rich moment that I think uh, encouraged all of us to think more about expanding this program and what a great gift it is to our community too, to have our students interacting with these people who have rich stories, documents, uh, artifacts that they want to share with other people. And then how can we do more with that on behalf of the whole aging community that we have? We spent the last couple weeks really working in the lab. I kind of did a lot more individual workshopping with each of the students, just seeing where you're at with the project, what else you need, where you're going, what you're doing. So that's one of those places, like in your narrative, mm -hmm. you might just mention it and move on, you know? The fact that she, that's a choice she made, but we don't want to but you know, just based on the different culture, so I emailed Karen, because in my country, no one don't have children. Right. Everyone have children, right. so it's weird. Yeah. So I ask it. Well, that's like, I'm glad you're asking those questions mm -hmm. because it's a cultural interest yeah. question too. Mm -hmm. Very good. My role has shifted too um, in this writing process from the coach, the mentor, the scaffolder of examples along the way. Now we're at print deadline and we just need to make it clean, a clean kind of copy. Um, and then more about... Profanity. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. So you're just sort of skimming it over and keep doing that. Okay. So do that Tomorrow with the we're gonna start and cutting and pasting to figure out where certain things go. As most conversations and interviews go, they're not linear and well planned out. And so this is gonna help them just to figure out which sections go together with which parts. Because they tend to jump around a lot. And this conversation that Tinting had about um, Karen not choosing to have a child was pretty interesting because in her experience in China, that's not the way that things are done. Everyone has a child, but Karen's made a choice to have one and not to have children. So that was an interesting conversation culturally between the two of them. Many of them had a pretty good skeleton of it before Thanksgiving. But then when we came back, man, we were hitting the ground running because we only had the two weeks left. Um, our deadline to go to press um, to work at the printing house was on November 30th, but it really was pushed back a few days. And I knew that, I knew that one was gonna happen. And I talked with the printing house um, printer and we had worked out when, when things were going to come in. Yeah, it was worth it. Mm -hmm. It's so beautiful. It's and really, the like books look gosh. great. I'm really pleased with the work that they've done and the tremendous amount of work that they put into it. They're all very pleased to be done with that part. And then today, it was interesting, getting the book projects, several of them, I had them all on the table there, but several of them just sat down and just we're flipping through everybody else's. Like there was a community reading time that I wish I would have picked up on beforehand and just said, okay, everybody, let's just sit down and just read each other's work. Yeah, for sure. Um, and I'm thinking about next year as a way, maybe it's a community circle that we just have in our class, of a way for them to highlight, look at the beautiful work that I've done. My name is Shelby Myers. I'm a professor of English at Kirkwood Community College, and I think this is about the seventh or eighth year I've done the Life Stories Project. And um, every year it is so enriching for me as a teacher, as a professional, as um, an observer, to see the growth that these students go through and to read the stories that you all share with us. I really wanted them to have an opportunity for public speaking, informal. I'm not a speech class, but any time they have to get up and talk in front of people is a good practice, because you just need to do that. My partner was Louise Young. She is not here today, not sure why. But anyway, I chose these three pictures because it shows some of the really big influences in her life, her family, her career, and her faith. She told me that she learned a lot more from the jobs that she didn't get to keep, you know, because she was either fired or she left because of whatever problem. She said she learned more from that than the jobs that she was really good at. So I thought that was pretty interesting. A little bit of hope for me working at Pizza Hut. <laughs> so yeah, Carol Hintz. I, when I first met her, or rather before I met her, I did have like, some prejudices about uh, 
older people, like, you know, like, I don't know. Like, hey, they're gonna be really old fashioned, or like, I don't know. You know, it's just, I guess, kind of lame or something. <laughs> I don't know, that's just me. But when I actually got to met, meet Carol, it was really actually like a really pleasant surprise and I'm actually kind of happy that I got to meet her and got to clear up a lot of those prejudices that I did have. This is my part partner, uh, Judy, and there she is. She's, I, I, I don't know, I'm getting nervous now, but she's just a great person. Um, she's a little fireball and she's funny and she's just like your sister. She's like your grandma, she's like your mom, she's like your friend, she's like your cousin. She's just like all of them in one, and she's just always has a smile, and her eyes will just light you up too. And I just had a great time doing this project, and it was very hard, but the hardest part was trying to make it so it, I, that Judy would like it. Like that was always on my mind, like making sure it'd be good enough for her. So um, I want to thank Judy for being my partner, and I, I had a wonderful time. Thank you. Yeah, I, in the beginning, I was like the stereotypical teenager that was like, oh my gosh, um, old people, they will never understand me, but it's crazy that all the things that I've been going through and that I have gone through, Joe has gone through as well. And just having the opportunity to talk to someone who has gone through the same things I did, um, give me wisdom so I don't make the same mistakes as she did and make my life a little better, it's amazing. And I think every young person has to understand that, that it's not that they don't understand you, they just are wiser and they tell you things that will make your life better. They can see how, how alike generations are, that just because of age, you're not any different than they were. And I think that that's what they saw too because you have a lot more experience maybe, but you have a lot of common values and a lot of common experiences. It was really good for me because it made me uh, think about um, what happened in my life, what, what you know, I, memories came back, and I really, I really appreciated that. What are we trying to do here? We're trying to build community, we're trying to teach our students to be good writers, we're teaching them how to be good community members active participants in society and advocates for their own voices and their own educational experience. And I think this project embodies all those things. They gotta get out of the classroom, they gotta write stuff, they gotta talk to people they don't know. They have to learn to na navigate those uncomfortable situations um, and First, produce a big project at the end. And also to put I themselves out there too. Those are all great life skills for them. This project was amazing. I gained a friend. Yeah. How? We're friends yeah. for a long time. What more can you ask for, right? Before the, the Life Project, um, I didn't see people as their story. I saw them as, oh, they're just, they're just there. And so I guess every time I interact with people, I want to know who, who they are in more of a sense of their story. Um, so it opened my eyes a lot into seeing the world differently. These days could go on forever, bringing whatever, you're always just the same. These times I don't want to leave behind, these treasures are hard to find.
never stops burning, I can see And I know just what you mean to me These days